Thank you so much for coming. We're going to talk about uh, organizing neuroimaging data uh, at the session uh, and a particular way of organizing data. Uh, but before I actually tell you uh, more about this particular standard, let me introduce you to Professor Smith. So Professor Smith is an up-and-coming uh, early career researcher, having plenty of different ideas. She's running her own lab, uh, like uh, some of you uh, already do, or many of you will in the future. Um, and she's always on the lookout for, for new ideas, new experiments, uh, new projects. And she just uh, realized that she could address one of the questions uh, concerning um, uh, attention uh, using a data set that was acquired by one of her PhD students before. Um, so basically the its study is very simple. Uh, can we use eye tracking signals that was acquired because why not uh, for a different experiment during resting state to see whether this participant was actually sleeping or not and see what are the correlates of you know this dozing off in the scanner. Um, so then she's like, okay, this is perfect. I've got this new postdoc coming in, uh, and that postdoc can take over that data. Simple, right? Yes, of course. And, uh, and Mike, who, who's the PhD student who acquired the data, uh, is, uh, is a data scientist somewhere <laughs> in California right now. Uh, as you can see, he's wearing the data scientist uh, uniform, shorts, and using data scientist equipment, the surfing board. Um, well, Mike is unreachable. Uh, it was very hard to actually find the data physically, but when that magical USB stick was uh, finally discovered, um, it turned out that it contains heaps of data uh, in a very disorganized way with different Excel spreadsheets. No one knows what the columns mean. Uh, no one knows uh, what the files are. So basically, it's a situation of getting lost in the data that were acquired very close to you. Uh, and sometimes, to, to some extremes, uh, you might even get lost uh, looking at your own data from five, six, ten years ago. Um, um, and this is, this is problematic from many different points. Uh, first of all, it's harder to share data. And when I mean share, I, I mean it in, in, in a broad range. Sharing is also sharing with yourself uh, in the future, but also sharing with your colleagues, sharing with someone from your lab, sharing with a collaborator from a different uh, university doesn't necessarily mean publicly sharing. Because actually, scientists have been sharing data uh, within this very broad definition uh, for many, many years. Um, and then it also requires unnecessary manual metadata input. What does that mean, really, metadata and input? Um, well, basically, doing analysis, we have to quite often tell the analysis software uh, different parameters that are actually describing the data that we're trying to analyze. And when the data and the parameters or metadata are uh, dissociated, uh, then it's uh, easier to make mistakes. And finally, when uh, we, are, uh, we want to validate automatically such data sets, for example, from a point of view of, of publicly sharing or receiving a data set from a collaborator, that is much harder. You got basically a data set from someone and it's going to take you a while to figure out if everything is in order. So you have all these problems, um, but the question is whether uh, we, there's really nothing we could do about this. Um, well, MRI has been, uh, fMRI has been done for over 20 years, it's hitting almost 29 now. Um, and, and during that time, we had like an explosion of papers. Uh, there are so many studies in so many different cognitive states and paradigms uh, being researched. Uh, MR itself is even older and it's being used even more like orders of magnitude more, especially in the clinic when we talk about structural imaging. So there's a lot of uh, data coming in. But what is very interesting about MR specifically, and what actually made us hopeful that we can come up with some standardization, is that um, uh, there are four major uh, MR uh, scanner manufacturers. So most of this data is coming from a, a limited number of uh, sources. Uh, and when you think about the restriction of doing an experiment inside an MR scanner, well, there's also 
certain limit to what people can do in the scanner, so paradigms cannot be completely crazy. Uh, so uh, that gave us initial hope, and uh, I'm just going to make a disclaimer that the standard that we are working on uh, have um, actually went further than MR, and now we are uh, supporting other types of neuroimaging data. But that was the initial impulse. Um, so the standard itself is called Brain Imaging Data Structure. Um, and it's a data organization and description uh, in the same, at the same time. Uh, so what I mean by that is that it tells you how your files should be organized, where they should be, how they should be named, but also what file formats you need to do, and what metadata you need to provide for each uh, particular type. It's a, it's a standard that means that it's strict. You have to do things in a very specific way, which enables uh, computer machines API programs to actually read uh, the metadata. Um, and just to reiterate, who's it for? Um, uh, especially lab PIs and anyone who is uh, uh, managing larger groups or even smaller groups of, of researchers, even if you are working on your data set and you have uh, research assistants or undergraduate helpers, uh, there is collaboration already going on, there is already data sharing going on, and that's why it makes sense to basically agree upon a certain way of how you're going to organize your data. Um, and then workflow developers, uh, I know at least some of you are designing different workflows, pipelines, methods, uh, and being able to rely on a particular way how data is organized, uh, how the input data is organized, makes your life much easier, especially if we provide tools to validate whether those inputs are organized appropriately. Um, and then finally, database curators. This is a much smaller group, uh, but it's important, especially now when we're seeing more and more data sharing, more, more requirements for data sharing on repositories. Actually, taking in those data, set, data sets is, uh, is tricky, and it's time consuming to validate those, but that's uh, helping. So in other words, what we aim to, to provide is a language. It's, it's basically a way for um, different uh, participants of this community to talk about their data. Uh, so we have data producers uh, uh, that provide the data, uh, and then uh, we have different uh, applications such as quality control tools, um, uh, as well as data processing uh, pipelines, but then we have also repositories and we have collaborators, and now we all can speak uh, the same language. So when we, when we started this project, uh, we really wanted uh, it's to be uh, successful and uh, highly adopted, uh, widely adopted. Um, and, and that's why we went the, the long route of making the community project. Uh, so we really wanted to hear uh, everyone's use case. We really wanted to have as many scientists involved in this project as possible. And we still do. And, and the project is still living on. I'm going to talk about this, uh, the, the existing extension and ongoing work uh, a little bit uh, at the end. We also did not want to reinvent the wheel. We didn't want to create something completely brand new unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, so we did talk to people and ask them, like, what do you do in your labs? Because uh, many labs already have certain internal standards for describing and organizing the data. Um, and we wanted to build on top of that. We wanted to reuse existing file formats instead of creating a new one unless it's absolutely necessary. And finally, the 80-20 rule. Um, so we didn't want to be bogged down trying to figure out edge cases that happen very, very rarely. We wanted to cover the 80% of the uh, cases in 20% of the time. Um, and, and that was very important, and we have to like constantly remind ourselves that the goal is to fix the most common cases, even though it's easy to uh, spend a lot of time discussing some uh, edge case. So, what is BIDS uh, uh, really in practice? Uh, basically, we're trying to go from this unstructured heap of raw data uh, put out uh, by your scanner and other instruments, because we're talking also about behavioral data, we're talking about physiological data, uh, and things like that, into a neat, organized, 
file folder structure um, with uh, uh, names that are intuitive, uh, yet formalized, uh, as well as file formats uh, that contain data in a machine readable way. Um, and speaking of those file formats, um, we are using, oops, we're using tab separated value files for tabular data, very simple text file format that is readable by many, many different tools, including Pandas, uh, as well as uh, MATLAB and R tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and that uh, file format is used throughout the structure. Here, I'm showing you the participants.tsv file, the very top level um, of the uh, organization. Um, and that, uh, that top level describes basically demographics. So this is where you're gonna put things like age, gender, and stuff like that. We have provisions for putting large amount of questionnaire data. So if you, you know, administered like 40 different questionnaires, you wanna have item uh, data. It's also possible, uh, and you can split those into individual files. Uh, so we also accommodate that uh, use case. And you probably noticed that um, there is a, a structure of uh, folders denoting different participants. There's a sub-01, sub-02, sub-03. Those are basically data from a particular uh, participant. And underneath that, you have different uh, modalities, and inside those, you have different data types. Um, and speaking of uh, data, uh, for the binary MR imaging data, we're using Nifty uh, and uh, a couple more file formats for a recently merged MEG extension uh, that I can go tr over uh, in detail uh, if, if there's need for that. Um, we're allowing both uncompressed and compressed Nifty, uh, and just to kind of answer questions why nifty and not other file format it's basically the most the most commonly used uh, file format out there and it seems to be uh, meeting the the requirements of of most use cases out there uh, with some uh, uh, exceptions obviously um, and we're using this for both structural data, so T1 weighted images, as well as diffusion, so DWI, and uh, as well as uh, uh, fMRI. And you probably noticed that uh, each of these files um, have the structure of a key hyphen value underscore key hyphen value underscore uh, form. Uh, and that's standard across all of the file names. Um, so, uh, for example, you have subject so participant 01, task rest uh, underscore bold. Uh, we had a lot of discussions uh, how to denote resting state, and basically the conclusion was that resting state is nothing else than a very unspecific task. Um, and this is how uh, this was resolved. And then uh, we also have. Um, uh, JSON files, and those are dictionaries uh, of metadata. Um, and uh, this is where you're going to have a controlled vocabulary of uh, keys, uh, and each of them has a definition in the specification, so you know what they they mean. Many of them are related directly to uh, DICOM fields. And we really focused on the fields that, that are necessary or very useful in data analysis, you know, such as repetition time, slice timing, and things like that. Um, uh, so this is where those uh, uh, pieces of metadata can go. And then finally, uh, this whole specification uh, uh, that took quite a while to, to put together um, would be, there's a very long document that might be a little bit tricky to follow, uh, but we also put a lot of effort into building a tool to validate your data sets. Uh, so when you're trying to, or you're in the process, or you're in the process of converting your data to bids, uh, you can have almost real-time feedback on whether you, you have any issues still to resolve or whether your job is done. Uh, and this is the validator, uh, which is a very nifty uh, JavaScript tool, um, which means that uh, you can run on the command line, like any other command line tool, as well as in the browser. Uh, so you can just go uh, to this website, I'm going to go do all of that uh, together in a moment. Um, and. Uh, 
point to the folder where your bits data set is um, and uh, it will tell you whether there are any errors or other issues uh, with that particular data set. Uh, and that is happening completely client side, so uh, this is basically a static page, so none of your data is actually shared or uploaded anywhere, uh, which is uh, useful for uh, sensitive uh, data. Okay, um, so uh, with these resources and, and this uh, form of, form of a standard, uh, we can revisit Professor Smith, uh, who uh, with her next project and the next data acquisition uh, can now uh, either uh, do this herself or um, tell uh, some of her students uh, to adhere to a standard operating procedure such as BITS and then in the future um, basically living in this standardized, well-defined world um, without any uh, problems with uh, data organization. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through a little bit, uh, sorry, walk you through some resources that have been uh, put together over the time uh, to help you adopt bits and, and start using it. Um, hmm. Um, so this is uh, part of our website, bits.neuroimaging.io, um, um, which lists uh, the resources that are necessary. The most important one is probably the Bit Starter Kit. Uh, uh, this is a project that is uh, collaborative, like almost everything we do, um, uh, supervised by, by Kirsty and, and Dora, uh, as well as Elizabeth. And uh, we have a Google Summer of Code students working on it right now, um, Patrick Park. And I'm going to show you that website in a, in a moment. Uh, you can also download examples, uh, both from Open Neuro, which I'm going to talk about uh, during the next lecture a little bit more, uh, as well as there's a GitHub repository with stripped down uh, versions of those data sets just to explore the structure. Uh, and we also have a, a forum for uh, questions. Um, and I talked that this is a community-driven uh, project, but um, I think this is the most important aspect of this endeavor. Uh, and I cannot really stress this enough, how important it was uh, to, to go down that roof that um, we didn't just like sit down with like four other people from the same lab and just come up to, and tell everyone else what to do. Um, we really wanted to hear uh, everyone had public call for comments, uh, meetings during um, conferences, uh, and, uh, and things like that. Um, and that led to, for example, uh, the paper describing bits having a ton of co-authors from many different labs, um, which uh, I'm pretty proud of. And that was uh, then um, carried on with the bits up paper. I'm going to talk about bits ups uh, during the next uh, lecture. Uh, we had some uh, meetings dedicated to building tools for, for bids, um, during which uh, we had a lot of fun, as you can see. Um, and, and that community is completely open. So I really encourage uh, all of you to join it. And you can contribute in many different ways. Um, I will be, we'll be bitsifying our own data in a moment. And probably you might run into some issues with the documentation. And helping making that documentation better for others is already a very valuable contribution. Uh, if there is a particular data type or a sequence um, that is not uh, covered by the standard, uh, you can help us uh, standardize it as well. All of our communications are open. There's a public mailing list. Uh, uh, the draft, current draft of the bit, bit specification is also publicly available and open for comments, even anonymous, uh, on um, Google Drive. And we have uh, sort of organically uh, uh, came um, to uh, this uh, procedure for extending bits with additional um, uh, modalities uh, because this process is harder uh, because of the inclusion of the community. Um, it's, it's more meaningful and I think it's more sustainable, uh, but it's much harder to reach an agreement with a, with a diverse group of people over you know, nine different time zones. Um, so, so the procedure we, we came up with, uh, if you want to extend the, the standard with a, with a large uh, uh, chunk of works, I'm not talking about like fixing a typo or you know, adding one, one type of a file, but something uh, larger, 
um, it's basically uh, it basically boils down to uh, drafting the extension proposal with a smaller group of experts who have something that you can show everyone else and discuss with the larger community. Uh, and while you do that, uh, it's also very useful to provide examples um, uh, as well as start extending the validator. And I've, I found myself that sometimes things were completely clear in my head, but as soon as I started actually writing some code that was supposed to take advantage of it, things were like, oh yes, we have to actually specify this and that. Um, and then we uh, um, reach to the broader bits community as well, ask for public comments, and we are trying to reach consensus in terms of merging that particular standards. Um, we update the validator, merge the document, and release a new version. Um, uh, but that's the sort of uh, often highly technical work uh, concerning different um, details of uh, data, uh, but uh, no less important is uh, work on um, uh, getting new users and helping new users uh, use bits. Uh, and this is, as I mentioned, covered uh, to a large extent by the uh, Bit Starter Kit, which provides its own templates uh, as well as links to external tutorials. And that's a great place to, to go when you want to get uh, involved and uh, start using it. And we're going to we're gonna uh, check it out in a moment. Um, so, just to uh, just to show you a little bit how over the years uh, this project has has grown. We uh, at some point a few months ago, five years ago, we we did this like very informal call out of like who's using it. We and we basically listed got a sorry got a response from over 60 different labs that are using it um, and there are multiple repositories right now that use it open neuron is using it as well um, uh, and if you look uh, at publicly available data that is in bids uh, you can combine data from 20,000 participants at this time. And that's, that includes only unrestricted publicly available data. I'm not talking about anything behind a, uh, a user agreement. Which also means that, all that if, if all that you're interested in is reusing public data sets, uh, being able to, to understand the standard and building tools that take advantage of it uh, is very useful. OK, so this is. This is the only URL that you actually really need to know uh, at the end of uh, this theoretical introduction. But what we're going to do next um, is we're going to um, bitsify a data set. So I've got uh, some example data uh, on my high drive, uh, and I'm going to show you how gradually I can uh, convert it into bits. Uh, and then I'm going to do it manually. And it's bit of a disclaimer in the beginning, I don't expect anyone to actually convert their data manually uh, in that way. But it's a great educational process to, to learn how uh, different things are named, what's inside those, uh, those uh, files. Uh, but there exist tools that uh, actually can uh, convert data almost fully automatically for you. And I'm going to link to those uh, as well. Uh, but you know, it would be a bit boring to like, show you how all of this can be done uh, automatically. Um, but now we can learn more about the, that structure. OK, so who brought their own data? Excellent. So, <coughs> for those who did not, so I'm going to bits neuroimaging.io, uh, and if I go to getting started, I can go to the bit starter kit, um, and bit starter kit is a is a is a technically it's a GitHub repository uh, with lots of different resources, and also lists different tutorials, um, and for those that would like to don't, did not bring their own data, would like to uh, work with someone else's data, um, I uh, recommend checking out this tutorial, um, which was written by uh, Franklin Feingold from, from our lab. And this tutorial is using uh, NKI Rockland uh, test retest data. Um, 
which you can uh, download now uh, and follow this tutorial. Uh, it's actually a part of three series tutorials uh, where um, you know the initial one is something that we're going to do right now, which is uh, converting the data uh, two bits uh, manually to to learn more about the format, uh, followed by automating it uh, or basically writing a custom script that. Uh, automates your particular uh, conversion of your particular data to bits. And finally, uh, he's also showing how to use a, a, a ready uh, tool uh, called Hudiconf uh, to do the uh, conversion. Uh, so if you have if you have problems accessing the, the NKI data, uh, there's another data set um, There's another data set as part of the third tutorial, which doesn't load for me for some reason, um, which, is, which is actually my connect now, which is the data set that Russ Paul Drug acquired by scanning himself 197 times. Um, hmm, okay, cool. I'm gonna use the NKI uh, Rockland uh, data and and yes. Mm -hmm. Hey, great. So, let me just show you how my data looks like. So, I've got this folder here. Um, and this is going to be the root of my data set. Um, and right now, um, if you have your DICOM files or any other PARREC or any raw data, you should create a folder called source data, uh, one word, and put all of that data inside that folder. Um, and this is where we're just going to put the, the data before the conversion. Uh, and it can be in any form and structure uh, as you want. Um, so uh, in here, I have a bunch of subfolders inside of those subfolders. For example, here I have this um, uh, folder called Anat with a bunch of DICOM files. Um, probably each of these files corresponds to a different slice. So what I have to do, um, as you remember, all of the imaging files and uh, and bids uh, are in Nifty. So I need to convert from uh, DICOM to Nifty. And there are multiple uh, DICOM to Nifty converters, as you know. Uh, some of them support uh, bits directly. And when I mean they support bits, I mean they can extract metadata from DICOMs and put them uh, in that JSON file uh, that um, um, bits uh, specifies. Um, so I'm going to start with this anatomical scan and I'm going to use a tool called DCM to NIIX uh, developed by Chris Warden among others. Um, so DCM to NIIX. So I'm going to get this tool um, and if I go to releases um, I can download this command line tool for free major uh, platforms. So I think this is a good time to stop a little bit uh, because getting that tool will be quite important for converting your data. Um, so let's take like a minute or two just to download this and make sure it works. And if anyone has any questions so far, I'm very happy to answer. I have a Uh, so yes, so, so this has mostly penetrated the research community rather than the clinical community. Um, and and we, we talked to many people, we talked to DICOM people as well. 
Uh, I don't think I, I know anyone from Radnet personally. Um, uh, so in a way, we didn't make a very specific effort to talk to Radnet people, uh, but uh, we we did basically try to talk and we want to talk still to as many. So basically that's the bottom line, hook us up. Um, uh, but, and also just to, just to clarify, this is, this, is a, this is not something you can, well, anyway, it's gonna be clear. Like it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a data structure rather than a database, yes? Um, so, yes, yes. That's fine. That means that uh, w you will have to uh, figure out a, a few pieces of metadata, but they're probably going to be very straightforward, the, those that are required, um, and, and we can help you figure those out. Um, if you have, uh, for example, PDFs of the scanning protocol, um, that might be useful uh, to figure out some of this metadata. Okay, who's got DCM to NIX installed? Excellent. I see there's an overlap between people who have data and who installed TCM to NIX. This is great. Um, cool. Uh, great. So this is this tool. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite old, I have to say. Uh, the tool has been developed for many years. Uh, so it has a very unusual or very relatively unusual command line interface. Um, what we basically need to do is, uh, as the instruction says, we call the DCM to NIX. It will not have the .exe or .exe uh, if you're using like a Mac or Linux. Um, and then uh, we have to specify where we want to put the data and then specify the directory with the DICOMs uh, that we want to convert. But there are other options here. Um, Okay, sorry. There are other options here, as you can see. One of them is this dash b. So dash b creates that JSON file when you do the, uh, the conversion. And it's turned on by default. Um, and there's also dash ba, which anonymizes uh, the metadata. So it removes information about um, a time acquisition of sorry, time and date of the acquisition, which is uh, uh, perceived at least by, by some experts as uh, non-HIPAA compliant. Uh, and that's also turned on by default. Um, what we want to turn on though is compression uh, because we want to make .nii.gz files instead of uncompressed files. And to do that, uh, we need to switch to uh, switch the dot z, uh, sorry, dash z uh, flag. So I'm here, I want to convert fi files from uh, the anat folder, so I'm going to dcm to nix. Output folder will be the root of my uh, bits directory for now. Uh, so there will be data, nki, and then I'm going to do Z as compression equals Y and this. Oh wait, sorry. Oop. Great. It's like uh, extreme programming, isn't it? Like with the whole room telling you all the things they did wrong. Um, Okay, so I've converted one scan uh, to nifty. If I go to my folder here, two files appeared. Uh, we need to all get to, to that stage, basically. Um, so I'll let you convert your file. I recommend starting with an atomical, but you know you can you can you know UBU and start with functional or diffusion or uh, anything else. So what you see here is a JSON file. So someone at some point thought it would be a great idea to write a text editor in JavaScript because it's going to be so quick and fast to load with no waiting whatsoever. Okay, 
Um, and inside this JSON file, you see that the converter extracted a bunch of metadata from that nifty file uh, and put it in here. And this is very convenient. Uh, and for many types of scans, uh, this can be done completely automatically, but not for all. Uh, DICOM uh, uh, coming from certain manufacturers does not does not <laughs> the robots are coming uh, does not include uh, um, certain pieces of metadata that you might have to include manually uh, and that is for example problematic with Philips scanners uh, or some uh, G uh, scanners okay so we have this JSON file and we have this other nifty file but you know this doesn't look neat. This not this is not the structure of the subject um, Anat folders I was showing you in the figure. So what we need to do is first of all I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna cut or copy those files and I'm gonna create a new folder. I'm gonna call it subject 01. It's the first subject. And a note here: the 01 is a label. And you can use any alphanumerical label uh, to identify your subject as long as each of them has a unique identifier. Uh, so this could be anything. This could be, uh, you know, control 01 or skiz 05 uh, or whatever uh, you think is uh, appropriate. But it has to have the sub sub dash uh, prefix. Okay, as you remember, uh, here we need to have another folder called ANAT for anatomical scans and now we copy it here. Uh, okay, this is great. Um, I need to also add one more file in the very top um, and this is quite important. Uh, All right. I need a dataset description.json file, um, and each dataset needs to have this um, this one file, uh, and you can put uh, metadata about the dataset, such as you know who created it, what's the license of it, what's the description of it, uh, which bits version was used to curate it, um, and uh, things like that. Uh, but there are two fields that are uh, compulsory. So a, a JSON file, um, just to add a little bit more background, a JSON file is a dictionary file which uh, uses curly brackets uh, to open and close and then uses double quotes to escape key values. So you've got two fields, bits version, and I'm going to use 1.1.1 and name. And those fields, fields are defined in the standard I'm going to show you. Uh, right now, example, okay, cool. So if I go to, doo -doo -doo -doo, if I go to the bits.neuroimaging.io page, I can download the specification, which is a PDF document. Um, and here, among many different other uh, files, uh, we can go to dataset description. And this is basically a document that you will revisit trying to figure out how to uh, organize your data. Um, so this is the dataset underscore description.json file which has the following fields. And as you can see, some of them are required, some of them are recommended, and some of them are optional. So you have to at least put the required ones and one of them is bits version, which is the version of the standard that we're using and we're using the 1.1.1 version and um, the name, which is also required. So that's how I know what to put in this uh, particular. Uh, okay, so now I promise that we're gonna have a helper 
So I'm going to uh, use the bits validator. You can basically Google bits validator and you can find it. There's also a link to it from bits in your engine.io. And this is, again, a GitHub repository. Uh, just emphasizing this is all a community project. So if you found a bug in the validator, or you want to add additional check in the validator, all contributions are very much welcome, including documentation as well. Um, but the first thing you can learn about the validator is how to use it. And there are two modes. As I mentioned, a command line tool, uh, as well as a web-based solution. Um, we're going to use the web-based one because it doesn't require us to install anything and we can just use it from any uh, Chrome or Firefox browser. So, sorry, Edge. Anyone using Edge? Uh, well, there's Opera as well, yes? And Safari? No, Opera Edge. You're using Edge? Using Opera, okay. Uh, so, yes, so we're going to go to this page. Um, and that is the validator. So here I can navigate to the folder where my files are. Um, and what is important is that I will point to the root directory, which is the directory that contains the source data folder and the sub-01 folder. Um, I click upload, which is misleading because actually nothing gets uploaded. You can do it in, um, yeah, you can do it in uh, airplane mode. Um, it's just this is how the API of Chrome is designed that this button always has to say upload, but nothing is uploaded. You can check it. Um, and now the analysis was completed and we've learned um, a few things. There are two errors zero subjects, which is already concerning because there should be at least one. Uh, and one session, the whole thing is very big. So, so what is going on here? Uh, and we have an error um, telling us that these two files are not um, named uh, in the way that, that bits instruct us to do. Um, we also got another error saying that you know, there's this subject or one, but actually there's no bits compatible data in it. Uh, okay, so what did we do wrong? Let's go back to the specification and see how these things have to look like. Well, the files need to be named according to this scheme, sub dash, name of the subject, underscore T1 weighted image, if it, this is T1 weighted image. Let me just check very quickly. You know, but it's saved and sorry. Whether I'm not like converting a T2 image. Looks very T1 ish to me. Perfect. So I have to rename it now. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So, sub, dash, what should I write? O1. O1, okay. What's next? Like that? Underscore. underscore. Yes, underscore. Yes, okay. Here? No, no. Is anyone listening? Okay. Great. Um, and because this JSON file describes that nifty file, it has to have the same name with exception of the extension. That's what we call this sidecar file. Subject 01 T1 weighted. JSON. Okay. Let's go back to the validator, choose a file. Success. This is a valid bits data set with one subject and one scan, and we did it. Um, yes. So, so how are your conversions going? Did anyone manage to to get to like a clean one subject, uh, one data type? Yes. You did. 
Okay, excellent. You have one success story, which is all I need, really. Uh, anyone run? Anyone run into any troubles I can help with? All right, let's let's carry on and let's add some functional data. Um, So, sorry, let me just see what do we have here. We have this breath hold um, um, paradigm. So let's convert that. Right, so it's a great question. Let me just repeat this. What do we do with longitudinal studies where there are multiple visits? People come over multiple days. Maybe there is like a first session and they like run on a treadmill or they like learn how to be a taxi driver for three months and they come back. Yes? All right. So um, uh, le let me just show you how does this look and that'll be quicker. So for that particular case, because what we uh, figured out is that the majority of data sets are cross-sectional, not longitudinal. Um, so we decided, uh, for better or worse, that the additional hierarchy level for denoting multiple sessions uh, should be optional. Uh, so that's why you haven't seen sessions yet. Um, but um, it basically looks like this. So you have the subject, and inside the subject, you don't go immediately into ANAT um, or FUNC or DWI. You have another folder for denoting sessions. Um, and please also note that that session uh, is also in all of the file names. And the fact that there is some redundancy, so you have this information and this information both in the file name as well as the location of the file name because it is in that folder is actually an intentional feature uh, because that allows you to, for example, quickly copy all of those files to a temporary folder and they will not override each other, uh, which could be useful for some applications. Uh, so this is how you would do a, a multi-session uh, data set. And we also have a rather liberal definition of what the session is. So a lot of the discussions uh, concerning the standard is what things are. Uh, and in terms of session, it's basically a logical grouping of scans, uh, which means that it doesn't necessarily mean an uninterrupted um, stay of the participant inside the scanner. So if you have a, uh, a scanning session, uh, you, you scan the participant, and in the middle of it, the participant says they need to go pee pee. Uh, you can still uh, use that as a logical session, the discounts before and after PP. Um, oh, yes, so the session folder, uh, you can skip that, uh, that level if you don't have multiple sessions. So if you're in that like 70 or 80% of people who have um, um, you know, cross-sectional studies and they don't invite participants uh, again and again, uh, you have one level less of, uh, uh, of stuff. And as I said, for better or worse, I'm flipping every other day whether that was a good decision or not, but it is what it is. Like This is the standard right now. Um, Okay, so let's see how the conversion went. Okay, so we have a new file to play with. Um, again, we have a JSON file. Okay, before, I, before it shows up, what are the important pieces of metadata for an fMRI uh, acquisition? What are the things that we cannot uh, do anything without? Nah, it's, mm, Anyone? Anyone? TR? Yes. Uh, anything else that is super useful or could be useful depending which school of analysis you come from? Like? Yes. Yes. 
And then if you, you know, if you're like really into orbital frontal, say, then what else? Huh? Field max and phase encoding direction. Um, so all of these fields are defined in bids uh, and depending on the uh, um, DICOMs uh, and the converter, they might be automatically extracted or you might have to put them in manually. But in this case, uh, what we are seeing here is repetition time, 1.4. And it's strictly defined that this repetition time is in second and has to be in seconds. Um, and I can, show, I can show you in a moment that we are actually checking this. Uh, and then here we have slice timing. Um, this is a multiband sequence and therefore you know, time zero happens multiple times. This is not your typical ascending descending because that's a little bit too um, imprecise. This is actually the timing of acquisition of each of the slices. Uh, so it covers multiband uh, sequences as well. Um, so let me just very quickly put that where it should be and see what the validator says. Um, Go for it. So I, can't, I don't know who asked about the um, if you have MIFIs already, but you don't have the DICONs. So the creation of that JSON file is is done by DICONs and it's super useful. Um, so you can fill it all in by hand, but it's like yeah, quite ours, a We use a different format, and we are, I don't even think we get the DICONs for the Anton holes and the, the functional ones come like zip. Yeah. So there's, if you look on the website, this is. I'm sorry, just I'm just filling time. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Go for it. If you look on the website, there's like 15 different converters, which is like really good. And so you know, somebody at your institution, if they don't already have a converter that will work, I bet there's I bet there's someone that will do it. Because as Chris said, you can get the PDF file and that you can like print out as human readable. That's fine. All the information's there, but like. Oh, okay. So uh, I have. Going to find task, right? Yes, I will. Uh, so let me just I copy it instead of moving it. Uh, but this is what we have here. Let me just. Okay, cool. So we have an error tells us that we need to define a field called task name, which we cannot infer from the DICOMS itself because the DICOMS standard doesn't know what paradigm and task was it. Um, so let me add this and I'm going to do, okay, let me just do this very quickly. Uh, and then I'm going to show you some other stuff. Right. Here, what I do basically, I can do task name and I'm going to call it Breffold. OK. Let me just revalidate this. OK, yeah, great. What's the warning? All right. Um, so you probably noticed that I don't have, this is a task, uh, but to actually analyzing task fMRI data, there's something more than repetition time and slice timing. I actually need to have a timing of the paradigm. I need to have a timing of the stimuli and timing of the responses depending of the, on the paradigm. And this uh, would be done normally in a file called events. Um, uh, also a tabular file. It's a very simple structure which has basically onsets, durations and different uh, categories of events. Um, we also have um, ways of storing the actual stimuli, so if you're showing images or movies, there's also a place to put them. Um, there's a lot to explore. 
Uh, there are a lot of different modalities, but those are the basic tools, the specification and the validator. Uh, and the tutorials uh, out there, I recommend you to uh, look them up. Doing this manually, I'm just going to reiterate, this is just an educational exercise. I would never do this for a real data set manually, but this is a way for me to explain what of these, these files mean. Uh, you're either going to automate it by writing scripts, which sometimes is necessary, especially when we just heard about like, oh, our scanner give us this weird format, they're not DICOMs, we have it zipped. Sometimes you will have to write a custom solution to do this conversion. Uh, but the standard itself is designed in a way to be rather straightforward to work with. But if uh, your scanner produces DICOMs, um, you might be able to get away with a uh, uh, sort of a more, more standard um, uh, automated solution called HUDICOM. And uh, when you go to Bit Starter Kit, and one of the tutorials is how to use HUDECONF, which is a heuristic DICOM converter. Um, so hopefully uh, this was helpful. Um, uh, Tal, do we switch rooms or? Yeah, I think so. I think you're going to move to one of three. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why, probably we decided we wanted to. to it's fine. I, I think they're. And uh, a, Anisha will be in here for web development. I think Anisha has one, like an hour and a half to give an hour, but. This is the last thing today. You guys probably know that we have nothing scheduled in the evenings, I think, until the last night next week. So, you know, whenever you get tired of listening to Chris, you're welcome to wander off and figure out your dinner plans. I've got a, uh, I've got a beer tutorial scheduled. A what? A beer tutorial. <laughs> it's like a drinking 101. All right. Uh, so, um, so basically, the next talk before I, before I go um, it will be about what you can do if your data is in bits, all of the different apps and all of the different services and tools you can use uh, if your data is bits. And let me just reiterate once more, this is all a community project. So if you know people that we should reach out, please tell us. Uh, if you uh, would like to add more modalities, more data types, please uh, reach out. If you want to help with documentation and tutorial, please reach out. Uh, all of this is open source and all of this is by scientists for scientists. So thank you so much and hopefully see you soon at Beer 101. Sorry, no, the, the other one. The